Tonight I am very honored to have with us Linda Hirschman to discuss her brand new book, Reckoning, the Epic Battle Against Sexual Abuse and Harassment, which you can take a look at right there if you don't already have one in your lap. Building on her previous books, the best-selling Sisters-in-Law and Victory, it provides a look at the history of our present moment from the earliest rumblings in the workplaces of the 1970s through the fight against rape on campus to the Me Too movement. Linda is a lawyer and political pundit whose writings also appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Republic, and more. And I couldn't be more excited to hear all about her inspiring, necessary, and perfectly timed work in the words of Jezebel's Anna Holmes. Joining Linda to discuss Reckoning is Margaret Sullivan, whose writing as the media columnist for the Washington Post speaks with clarity on the issues facing journalists and readers in an era of radical change. Margaret is formerly the public editor for the New York Times and sat on the board of the Pulitzer Prize from 2011 to 2012. I couldn't be more thrilled to listen in as they discuss the fight for equality and against patriarchal abusers. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Margaret and Linda to The Strand. Well, good evening, everyone. It's, uh, it's so nice to see everyone here. Um, I'm just thrilled to be able to introduce Linda and have her talk about her fabulous book, which I hope you'll all read with a lot of interest. And I, if you do read it, you will be reading it with a lot of interest because it's a great book. Um, and I, I thought we would, well, first of all, I want to say I will uh, start a conversation with Linda for a while and then uh, we'll go to some audience questions. So think about what you might like to ask, put it in the form of a question. Um, always a good idea. So um, Linda, why don't you start us off by kind of introducing the book to us? So um, you're all here at the bookstore. And from this, I infer that you know how to read. <laughs> and do not actually require me to read to you. Can you hear me? No. Okay, in the microphone. Do not require me to reach you, but if you'll just bear with me for one minute, I'll just take one minute of your time to share with you a tiny bit of my deathless prose. <laughs> Tanya Harrell was just doing her job at a New Orleans McDonald's in 2017 when a guy she worked with shoved her into the bathroom, locked the door, and tried to rape her. The only thing the 20 year old could do was cry and cry until he heard the manager calling, where were we, she says, and he finally let me go. Harold wasn't going to get any help, she knew, because the last time she'd complained that a coworker had harassed her, her shift manager at McDonald's had suggested the touching was consensual. Sure enough, when she told the new manager about the attempted rape, the boss treated her story like it was nothing. Harold, who had left high school so she could work to pay for the medicine her grandmother needed, could not leave her low-wage job. One year later, on May 22, 2018, Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, an initiative founded by prominent women in the entertainment industry, announced that they would be paying for Tanya Harrell and a dozen other low-wage workers from around the country to sue McDonald's and its franchisees for harassment. After all, sexual harassment had been recognized as a violation of the 1964 Civil Rights Act for more than 30 years. What a difference a year makes. What difference does a year make? Not that much. Use your mic. <laughs> Use your mic. Here's what makes the difference. This book starts at Chappaquiddick when Ted Kennedy drove his car off a bridge at Martha's Vineyard and in the car was a young woman who was still in the car but dead 
the following morning when Kennedy finally shared the information with someone. And it ends just the other day. <laughs> In, so the arc of history is long, and it doesn't bend toward justice exactly. It sort of wiggles toward justice, like a politician whose cell phone has been hacked. And its journey toward justice is pushed and pulled and tugged and led by activists and dedicated civilians in the social movement that we're looking at. And if I may use the arc for one more moment, since it is, after all, Pride Month, I will say there are three colors in the rainbow that is the arc toward justice described in this book. One is the legal system. One is the world of politics. And the third is the world of culture, most particularly in this case, the media. Which is why I am so honored to be here tonight with Margaret Sullivan, who is, as I said recently in a tweet, the conscience of the media. I represent all media. It was very... I once worked at a newspaper and the, the uh, many newspapers, but the editorial page editor, this was many years ago, would run up to me and I was a young reporter and he would say, Margaret, Margaret, I need to talk to you about this issue. I need the woman's point of view. <laughs> no problem. Is this working? Yes, kind of. Okay, so I thought, you know, there's so much in Linda's book that is, that is of great interest and it spans many years and it spans many personalities and many events. But I thought we'd be particularly timely uh, to start off and talk about Joe Biden. Um, since Joe Biden is in the news and Joe Biden is in this book. And um, so, I, Linda, would you please take us back to the Anita Hill hearings and Joe Biden's role? And, and I will talk about that a little bit and I will ask you this question. Should his failure in that situation, in your mind, disqualify him in the minds of those who care deeply about women's issues? So maybe I'll touch on that question a little bit first. I would vote for this half-empty bottle of water <laughs> if it ran on the Democratic presidential ticket. So just... You know, we're not arguing about what you are, we're just arguing about how low your standards are. <laughs> but Joe Biden is not, shall we say, one of the heroes of the reckoning. Um, and he was a really very powerful and influential senator and failed, are you listening, God? presidential candidate when, in 1988, when in 1991 he came onto the public stage as the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And the Judiciary Committee was considering for appointment to the Supreme Court of the United States, Clarence Thomas. And it emerged about, toward the end of the committee's proceedings um, in uh, approving Clarence Thomas, which they were clearly on the path to do, that there was a woman in Oklahoma, Anita Hill, who was muttering about Clarence Thomas having been abusive of her when she worked for him in 1983 and four. And when her accusations surfaced formally, the Senate Judiciary Committee was forced, term of art, forced, to reopen the hearings and take a couple days entertaining her charges that he was unfit because of the way he had treated her. Joe Biden, I learned in my research for the book, 
was a managerial committee chairman. There are many different kind of committee chairs in the Senate, and some of them let the members have more of a role in deciding what happens in their committees, or defer more to the um, majority leader of the Senate. But Biden was a managerial uh, chairman. Um, so we can fairly assume that the events that ensued were heavily his responsibility. He had the power to do other things. And as many of you no doubt know, the Senate saw fit to bring Anita Hill to Washington to testify about what had happened to her when, in the, when she was in Clarence Thomas's employ. And the Republicans waged a prescient, scorched earth campaign against her, slandering her character, concocting an entirely non-existent ailment of erotomania to level against her, because why else would someone accuse Clarence Thomas of sexual harassment? And um, they successfully defeated her challenge to his candidacy, and he sits to this day on the Supreme Court of the United States. Biden is an important character in my chapter on that event because he has a well-established reputation as someone who needs desperately to be liked. And he seems to have a particular weakness for being liked by Republicans. And Republican Senator John Danforth, who was leading the forces to get his former employee, Clarence Thomas, confirmed to the Supreme Court, rolled Joe Biden like a piece of sushi. <laughs> Repeatedly, on every aspect, the extent of the testimony, the order in which the witnesses would appear, how quickly they, whether they would hear the women who would corroborate Anita Hill. Every time there was a decision, Danforth leaned on Biden, and Biden caved. And um, I interviewed, so this was great. Right, I'm gonna take all of our time to talk about Joe Biden, which no, is no. tempting. You'll I have stop. many other questions. Okay, so here's why this is great. I did this research last year before people's pro and anti-Biden positions hardened. So they talked to me. I never know why someone talks to us. That's right. Yeah, they're nuts, right? <laughs> but you just call up and say, I want to ask you about yourself. And the next thing you know, they've said all kinds of damning things. And they did <laughs> about Joe Biden. Things which I know that the same very important Washington people would not say. No. So if you want to know the real story about Joe Biden, I'll Solid. sign it for you. <laughs> Good. So um, we talked a little bit in the green room about um, how women, the women, some of the women characters in this book who are real people, like Anita Hill and like Monica Lewinsky, have, you know, have turned out to look pretty good uh, in in our modern era, and um, and you said something. Uh, I said, "Why have they?" And you said the answer is kind of sad, but you didn't tell me what it was. So why is it that people like Monica Lewinsky and Anita Hill seem to have our admiration and seem to be such pretty cool people? Americans, and possibly people in other cultures as well, I specialize in studying and writing about America. Americans seem to like women when they're down and out. It's sort of the opposite of nobody loves you when you're down and out. If you're a woman in America, everybody loves you when you're down and out. Hillary Clinton. Right after he got caught for the 4,000th time in 1998, everybody suddenly loved Hillary Clinton. After Clarence Thomas was confirmed to a, have I mentioned, life tenured position on the Supreme Court of the United States, which is infallible because it's final, everybody suddenly started believing Anita Hill. She wasn't dangerous anymore. And Monica Lewinsky 
took longer, I was one of the very few people on this earth who took her side in 1998. I'm happy to talk to you in the Q&A if you want to about why. Um, but it was only after Hillary Clinton lost the presidential election and the Clintons tiptoed off the stage on their way to the dustbin of history that suddenly the woman who had the effrontery to tell, you know, stay out of jail by telling the special counsel the story of her sexual involvement with Bill Clinton became an icon. All of a sudden, Monica Lewinsky is someone everybody loves. I loved her in 1998. <laughs> but when she was in a position to harm a powerful man, they made her into trash. So that's a sad answer. That is a sad answer. I'm sorry. But it's a good answer. Thank you. Yes. Would Bill Clinton have survived if, if what happened then happened now? I mean, survived in the sense of his presidency surviving. Yeah, right. I, I, I right. Don't mean I didn't, I don't think yeah. someone would, no, God forbid. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> let me think. Um, I think he would not survive. And I think that I have a very interesting reason for that, which is, and the book is actually, if the book is the story of anything, it's the story of how the well-being of women and male victims of sexual harassment and abuse became the monopoly of the Democratic Party and was entirely realigned out of the Republican Party and into the Democratic Party so that an abuser and an assault person who's confessed to assault, like Donald Trump, can survive because he's in the party of abuse and harassment. But Bill Clinton would be in the party that has the interest of women pretty much monopolized, and not just sexual abuse and harassment, abortion rights and maternal leave, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, minimum wage, there's a lot of ways in which the Democrats have a monopoly over uh, women's well-being. So he would not survive, and uh, that is a very good example of the realignment, what I call the great realignment. Great answer. It's good. Can um, we do this again tomorrow? Yes, absolutely. Right. Um, I, I have many questions, and we can go to them, but I thought it might be good. Just maybe we'll, we'll see if there's, does anyone there? Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you for the wonderful book. And my question is the, oh. Uh, my question is the acts for the Me Too movement for sexual harassment appears to fall a little bit unevenly. And I'm just curious why some men like uh, Al Franken and Garrison Keillor were immediately banished from the public square, and yet someone like uh, Tom Brokaw, who had credible allegations against him, and NBC canvassed their workers to write a letter that we know Tom well, and he couldn't have possibly done this. He managed to survive quite well, and David Letterman, who was using his workplace as a harem, uh, went on to get the Mark Twain Prize for Comedy and given a Netflix special that's been renewed. Uh, so there's just a little bit of unevenness I'm curious about. So part of it is... That's a great question. It is a, it is a great question. She says this a lot, have you noticed? Um, so part of it is because they are, except for Al Franken, let me bracket Al Franken. The rest of the people you mentioned are like the women who got resurrected. They're not so powerful anymore. So Tom Brokaw was retired and living in one of those square states west of the Mississippi River. And um, David Letterman had retired. And um, Garrison Keillor was old and had retired. I do believe he had retired before the assertions against him came about. I'm not positive, but he was definitely on the wane. So part of it is that these men to the left were uh, exiting anyway. Al Franken posed a very different question, which is, 
Was the Democratic Party going to take a monopoly over the well-being of women, or was it not? And the really devilish and wonderful thing about that is that he got credibly accused by eight, count them eight, not like the person at my Thanksgiving dinner who did a full Kavanaugh when the subject came up, eight credible accusations of wrongdoing against Al Franken. They came up against him at the moment when the Democratic Party was fielding a candidate in Alabama, Doug Jones, against Roy Moore, a credibly accused Republican child molester. Okay? So the issue was you, a writer couldn't have, a playwright could not have made a better scenario than this. It was squarely posed. Are you going to own Al Franken and try and use Roy Moore's status against him in the election that's going to happen in two days? Or are you going to deacquisition Al Franken? And to their eternal credit, the Democratic Party deacquisitioned Al Franken. And if you want to argue about it, I have a lot of experience because every time I tell someone what I'm writing about, they start screaming about Al Franken. But the truth is, that's what happened. Eight credible accusations against him, and they were willing to pay the price. And I believe, as with perfect faith, that they will harvest the benefit of doing that. The primary, the donors, may they roast in hell, and the primary voters have made Kirsten Gillibrand pay the price for what the Democratic Party had to do. And I am sure she's not happy about that, and it's not fair. But I know her, and I think at the end of the day, she would be willing to have that on her tombstone. That's very interesting. Yes? So when you talk about the grand realignment, what about the 57, 52% of white women who are not coming along like what what do we do to to let them know that this alignment realignment has taken place and that perhaps some of their interests are better served the democratic party as opposed to the republican party which they've voted for all their lives and as far as we can tell at least half of them will continue to vote i think it's more like half than 52 percent and i know that this may seem well you know like uh who was it? Jeffrey Goldberg just told us size matters. Um, uh, I, I, that's an important difference because you can win elections if you can catch 50% of white women. You can, the Dem if the Democrats can catch 50% of white women, they can win elections. They did it in the midterms of 2018. That's exactly what the real good data shows, 50-50. And if you can capture 50% of white women who vote more in higher percentage than white men do, um, you can, with the virtue leaders of the progressive movement, people of color, <laughs> win a lot, meaningful number of elections. You just need to grind it down a little. Remember, the Electoral College is responsible for the election of 2016. The numbers in the three swing states are very tiny. You go from 42% you, white women for Trump to 49% white women for Trump, you win the presidency. So but, I'm but hopeful. Do you want to know why they do it? I have an answer for why they do it. Right. Uh, right. Okay. So, right. This is my friend Ellie Mistal, who's the great uh, lawyer and television um, funded. So, um, so they're scabs, they're free riders, okay? They're, right, there's a union on the scene, right? Feminism, we call it. We're making bargaining with women harder. So they offer themselves to white men and say, without saying, right, give us a little bit of the surplus that you get from the affirmative action program that is being a white man in America. And you gen white men generate a surplus white women can get a piece of that surplus if they will sell out their union sisters. And they are very comfortable doing that. I don't know that they think it through that well,
but they have, they are, but I mean, I've had conversations that would lead me to believe it's not entirely foreign to them. And, um, and so that's what they're doing. There is also the phenomenon that what, of what I call deep roots, which is the inheritance of slavery. America, the heir to slavery. The counties that had the highest degree of slavery in 1860 vote the most Republican right now. So a piece of it is that you have this wicked legacy and a piece of it is that they're behaving like rationally self-interested scabs. Who else? I want to talk about the opposite of Monica Lewinsky, Lorena Bobbitts. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Me Too protects people, uh, women in the workplace, but what about the abuse at home? How can we protect women at home? That is a fabulous question. That's a fabulous question. Um, so, the single family dwelling is anarchy, okay? Where there is no law, the strong rule, right? So treating domestic violence like a private thing means that the police won't, the police who represent law will not go through that door, right? So they leave women in the state of nature with their larger, stronger, not vulnerable in childbirth and nursing husbands or whatever it is that they live with used to be husbands when I was a girl. And, um, and they are in the classic state of nature where the strong rule. I will give Joe Biden credit for this. The Violence Against Women Act, which was written by a woman named Victoria Nurse and came out of um, organized feminism, um, was his project and he was faithful to it. And this is not a villain. Somebody who just needs so desperately to be liked by Republicans is a little weird, but not a villain. And the Violence Against Women Act is a very important part of beginning to bring the democratically controlled power of the state into the home so that women can be protected, even prosecuting the uh, wrongdoer against their express wishes is another way of doing it. So we are, and, and the Republican-dominated Supreme Court of the United States struck down a piece of the Violence Against Women Act as unconstitutional. Um, so we need the Equal Rights Amendment, but it's better, and that's the solution. You have to bring the power of society into that space. Why would that space be some weird thing that's immune? It's like. Lichtenstein or one of those little places on the map that doesn't belong to Europe, right? It's like, who, who creates these spaces that aren't part of the United States? So that would be a short answer. And a good one. For me, that's a short answer. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, at the beginning of this talk, you referenced kind of the three parts of the book, the culture or media and politics and the legal system. And it seems like in that order, they move at different speeds, right? You know, hashtags proliferate overnight and there are rather frequent elections here in the United States. But the legal system, it seems like, is lagging behind. We're all waiting for the Supreme Court to make a decision on Roe and it seems like every day there's a new piece about what the Supreme Court is gonna do on Roe and we know it's very conservative. So can you address how the massive shifts in hashtag me too and media and politics and the election of women in 2018 translate into the legal system? Okay, so I need to tell you a little fairy tale. Once upon a time, a long time ago, there was the Warren Court. <laughs> this was a court that was dominated, some of them were Republican appointees actually, including Earl Warren, um, by justices who had some sense of their moral obligation to fulfill the American experiment. 
and they decided a case called Brown v. Board, which said that separate and equal could never be equal. And for many years after that, up to and including the decision in Roe v. Wade, they extended the circle of the Constitution to increasing numbers of people. But at the end of the day, the court follows the election returns. And because the political piece of the arc was not moving as fast as the court was, it kept electing Republican presidents. And they kept appointing justices to the Supreme Court of the United States. It's now almost 50 years since 27 and 19 is, yeah, since Roe v. Wade. And finally, the forces of the Republican conservative political movement have controlled the Senate and the White House long enough to make a court in their image. And they are now a drag on the enterprise. But for a long time, the law was the leader. The court in 1986 made sexual harassment a violation of the Civil Rights Act in a case called uh, Meritor versus Vincent. So they were actually, as recently as 1986, leading in many of these ways. At the end of the day, the court follows the election returns. This is such an easy gig for me. Yes. <laughs> Well, um, you took the words right out of my mouth, but I was afraid she'd cut me off because she says I talk too much. <laughs> Just trying to keep it moving. Um, yes, I do. Pack the court, which is really, in my way of thinking, a very good phrase. I'm so sorry it got a bad reputation in 1937, which was when uh, Franklin Roosevelt tried to do it. I think almost everything Franklin Roosevelt did, except leaving the Jews to die in Europe, which is probably a subject for another night. Um, <laughs> was great, and so I think expanding the Supreme Court of the United States is just what we need to do. Someone, it may have been my friend Ellie back here, yeah. said on Twitter that uh, Mitch McConnell packed the court, or unpacked the court, by not letting Barack Obama appoint a replacement when Antonin Scalia d died, right? So he made a new court of eight. He reduced the court from nine to eight. Mitch McConnell did in 2015 or 16. So I see absolutely no reason, and it's completely constitutional. There's, a, uh, there's no reason why the court has to be a certain size. And by the way, there's no reason why the lower federal courts have to be a certain size either. So not only do we need to pack, and there's like, they're very backlogged. They need more judges. So as soon as we take the Senate and the White House, I think we should pack all the courts until there isn't a piece of luggage left in the Toomey <laughs> store. Yes. So the three arcs operate differently, right? The legal and political system, are, they are the formal structures of the exercise of power. Right. The media is not just reflective, but shaping of ideology, which then kind of informs and manifests, but it, they're, they're different frequencies, I would think. So are we looking at an ideological realignment or a sort of contingent alignment of different power structures? I'm asking that because the way you tell the story is the, you know, the rationale for why certain people you know, succumb to pressure around Me Too claims or don't, the reason that certain um, people rise in visibility or not really has to do with the balance of power. And I'm curious if, it's a, if you see a contingent change or a, a, a more deeper ideological shift about actually valuing the well-being of women. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Um, Margaret Sullivan said recently in a column that in response to the question where are our Woodward and Bernsteins now that we need them? These were the reporters who brought down Richard Nixon. Okay. And actually, maybe you could say what you said. I feel a little weird saying what you said. <laughs> well, that, that, um, that the media uh, can't, that the press can't do the job of accountability all by itself. That 
uh, during the, the Watergate um, era, the Nixon presidency, um, there were people like the federal district court judge John Sirica who, um, who basically went on a fact-finding mission and perhaps some people thought that he overstepped his bounds as a judge, but he, he caused a lot to happen because of a, he was seeking the truth. Um, and there was, you know, during the Watergate hearings, there was a Senate uh, that was not completely um, uh, politicized and venal. And so there were people like Republican Howard Baker who, um, who asked the question, what did the president know and when did he know it? You know, we don't really have anybody like that anymore. And so you need more than just the press or the media or journalists to get the job done. And I don't mean get the job of, I, I don't talk this way about, um, about President Trump. I don't talk about, and I don't think this way. We need to get him out. I don't think that way. I'm a journalist. Um, I, but I do think about truth telling and I think about accountability. And um, there, if you're gonna hold people to what they should be doing, it can't just be about writing stories. And uh, the protection and the e true equality and freedom and, and flourishing lives, which are the three touchstones of a good life for women, um, is much greater than just um, getting rid of the president or any particular political outcome. This is a huge change. My students used to say to me, why is this so hard? And I would say to them, how would you feel if you went to the garage one day, turned the key in your car, and the car said to you, I don't feel like going to work today. I want to go to the beach. To the men in power, women asking for equality and freedom and dignified treatment and flourishing lives feels as if the car spoke. So it is a very big change. And, um, but I write a lot about social movements. This is not my, okay, so I wrote about the gay revolution and I wrote about legal feminism and I was working on a book on abolition when I set it aside to write this book and I'll go back to it. So I, I, I think about your question a lot. Generally what happens is there are underlying causes for people to think outside the box. They can be economic and abolition, it was religious actually. And um, uh, the, uh, you have a person who sees the horizon. In my book, it's Catherine McKinnon, the law professor who cooked up the theory that uh, sexual harassment was a violation of the Civil Rights Act. In the gay revolution, it was a man named Franklin Kameny, who you've probably never heard of. Okay, you've heard of him, good for you, because um, he, you know, the government fired him in 1957 and he said, I didn't do anything wrong, this is your idea of what's wrong, I'm fine. And, uh, and uh, William Lloyd Garrison in many ways in the abolition movement. So, so you see someone who sees the horizon, they are like prophets. And they, if they get to say what they see, the media plays a big role in that, then it gets started. And in America, as Tocqueville said, all social issues come sooner or later to the courts. So our particular written constitution social system brings it to the courts. The courts answer, the election returns. The, um, the blessing of the media, and I say this not just because Margaret Sullivan is sitting here, but because it was cheap paper and steam printing presses that fueled abolition the most successful social movement in American history, went forward on the wheels of those printing presses. So, blessedly, the media is able, through the miracle of technology, to communicate that corrosive notion of freedom and equality. And, and if you're not blinded by your self-interest, your temporary, short-term self-interest, like the white women we discussed before, it's it's opioids. Yes. 
So I know that you know there are many uh, parallels between Stonewall and, um, and Me Too, but one thing that we haven't really covered together in our conversations about this is um, how commodification of these movements has really proliferated. Like, I went to Macy's the other day and I saw this whole sort of feminist, you know, branded, like, Me Too-esque setup. Like, they had an activation there with all of this Me Too stuff. And, of course, every corporation under the sun is changing their Facebook logo to the rainbow pride uh, symbol in some way. Now, some people think you know, uh, this is a bad thing because people are sort of taking this meaningful movement and they're commodifying it. But is there a way for activists and people who are serious about these movements to take advantage of, um, of that commodification in some way? I have something terrible to tell you. I don't think I have an opinion. <laughs> um, it, okay, so... Okay, so um, capitalism is capable of both good and bad consequences. In, when cotton was king, capitalism was the ultimate overseer sustaining slavery in America in the 19th century. So that was a market phenomenon. On the other hand, as people in the north started doing industrial things not related to textiles. The support for the Republican Party grew, that was when they were the good guys, in the north, and, and ultimately elected Abraham Lincoln. So there's a real economic shift that occurred which enabled the Republicans to take the government in 1860. So, so I think that it is a, an, it's a, it's a weapon, but it's not, it depends, I guess, on who wields it. Um, uh, I like to be, fa news flash, I like to be fashionable. And I think being in fashion in the way that you just described, like there were everybody when I went to the New York Phil the other night had rainbow badges on. I'm sure most of them have no idea why. But, um, but I think that's good. I actually think that's good. Um, okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that was, I think you ended up having a, an actual, you did have an opinion there. Um, yes, in the back. I'm strong. Yes, yes. Hi, uh, I'm from China, and Me Too movement happened in China last year, but it went on to a totally different direction. For example, there was a commentator said, uh, this kind of cases uh, are better adapted uh, to the courts and the legal system to deal with because uh, um, because the legal system uh, served for the justice, even though those kind of commentators knew that legal system um, doesn't work that perfectly for the female. And I totally agree that media is really powerful, but, <laughs> but for those kind of cases, I think it's a balance between how to support the female and how to like balance the interest between the female and the male as well, because uh, media is power to help, but it's also a power to destroy. So how do you respond? Those kind of uh, comments happen in China as well, because it's totally a different culture. Okay, so I, I never write about anything but the United States. I was educated to think in Western philosophical terms, and I have observed the society my entire adult life. And so I feel relatively confident in saying some things about American society and history. This is, so I, I wanna say, I'm probably really gonna say something dumb because I'm not deep the way I need to be to speak to these hard issues. If what you're asking is whether I'm giving enough consideration to the interests of the men, the answer is, that's right, I'm not. Okay? 
they have had their chance being on top since we dropped out of the trees in the African savanna. And uh, I am, except as allies, I am very little interested in their claims. Okay. Um, I would like to ask a question myself now. We'll come back to you. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, as someone who has had the privilege at a newspaper of stopping the presses once, which immediately put me into labor, by the way. <laughs> True. Um, I want to know about how this book actually, you had to, you and your wonderful people you work with, had to sort of stop the presses on the book because of the Brett Kavanaugh situation and the Brett Kavanaugh hearings and everything that was going on with that. So tell us about that. So this is really so aggravating, right? I was done. I wrote this book in 10 months, right? I got the contract in December. By October, I was done. And there are people in this room who know I was done because we were on the island of Santorini together. <laughs> and I was done, right? <laughs> and we were swimming in the wine dark sea and, you know, right? I was done. I come back. <laughs> I, I, it might have happened our last day there or while I was on the plane. And from out of the blue, a white Anita Hill, Christine Blasey Ford surfaces in California in many ways very similar to the Anita Hill story, by the way. She kept her secret all those years, and then the thought of him being on the Supreme Court of the United States became intolerable to her. She fumped around with it for a long time because she knew that she would get completely screwed by the system if she actually revealed herself. So it's a lot like Anita Hill, except she was like a white housewife that Rebecca Traster said was recognizable as female in the patriarchy, but it turns out it didn't, didn't matter. matter. Um, so I get this information as I'm flying home and um, th when I get home, there's a call from my sainted editor Deanne, at um, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, my wonderful publishers, Deanne Ermy, and she said to me, stop the presses. She said, you and, yeah, fortunately it was before the hearings. I came home from Santorini right before the hearings. So I sat on my bed, which is where my television is in my house, and with my computer on my lap, and wrote the story of the Brett Kavanaugh hearings as they unfolded in front of me as fast as I could because we thought we were going to production already. And she said something so wonderful. She's really going to go to publishing heaven. She said, I don't want your book to be out of date before it hits the shelf. And then we waited again for the midterms. So I'm fast. I'm not as fast as a professional journalist like you are, but I'm pretty fast, and they were wonderful. That's a good story. Yes. A people have, thank you. A couple people have talked about um, how the arc of uh, media or culture moves faster than uh, law or politics. Um, I guess I'm worried that it forgets quicker, too. You're already starting to see some of the uh, credibly accused sexual harassers. In some cases, uh, people who confessed, you know, Louis C.K. has attempted a comeback tour. People like Ken Friedman at The Spotted Pig are just quietly holding on, hoping people forget. As more and more uh, credible accusations of harassment come out, do you think... Um, these sorts of comeback bids are going to be largely unsuccessful? Like the cult, there's a sea change in the culture where these comeback bids won't be accepted? Or do you think as uh, the number of uh, credible accusers goes up, there's just going to be more and more of these comeback bids and some of them are just going to get through? No, I think that there will be, you know, social, so I sure do feel at this point, like I understand how social movements in America work. And it's, at the very best, two steps forward and one step back. It is not a smooth arc to justice. The movement that has held on the best is the LGBTQ movement. They, they are, have held on the best. 
but um, it there is, and there it'd be interesting to talk about why there. Are, there's pressure, particularly since women are scattered among the population by fiat of biology, where people's wives, sisters, bosses, employees, and so forth. There's pressure to push the deal back to what the men are comfortable with. Many white women are comfortable with because aforementioned behavior. And, um, and people are just comfortable with what they're familiar with. So there's always backlash pressure. And it's greater where women are involved because the price is so high. You cannot move to the suburbs and get away from your wife. So the price is high. And it is, penetrates in a Foucault kind of way. It penetrates the society. So there will be pressure. I believe that I want to end on a happy note. And, um, and the timing and is good for that. Good. Yeah, that's why I glanced So let's you. hear okay. it. I believe that the critical moment comes when someone like Frank Kameny or first Catherine McKinnon and then Gretchen Carlson, who we haven't talked about, says, this is not the natural order of things. This is a political decision that you, the oppressor, have made to construct a situation where I am harmed. Not natural in the LGBTQ movement. Not natural. Not sinful. Not subversive. Not crazy. Once people see that what's happening is a political, conscious or unconscious decision by the oppressors to erect a structure where they are oppressed, you cannot put that genie back into the bottle. That's been said. That's why they say, name it, claim it. And I, this audience is full of my witnesses. When Gretchen Carlson sued Roger Ailes and beat him, I called my agent and I said, this is Stonewall. So I think you can't, there will be backlash and backsliding, but I do not think that we will go back to the Matt Lauer place. So um, that's, that's great, and this has been fun, and what a fabulous audience. Um, I do want to say something that I've learned about Linda, who is a relatively new friend of mine, but now a good friend of mine, and that is that, um, like the, like the figure in Greek mythology, she is Cassandra. She is the person who sees what's coming. She really is. It's a really amazing quality, and rare. And so um, you'll find that in this book and in all of her books. And she really is a, um, an amazing woman and an amazing author. And thanks so much for being a part of this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. If you have a copy of Reckoning and you would like to get it signed, and then we're going to have you up here with some Sharpies and a bottle of water. Uh, if you want to line up on my right or left side of the room in front of the speaker, we'll sign some books. If you do